So, whenever the topic of Disney princesses comes up online, it's a relatively common take to see the older princesses being hated on. I'm talking Aurora, Cinderella, Snow White, you get the idea. People like to complain about the passive nature of the princesses in older Disney movies, or say that they needed to be saved by a man. This is, frankly, a misogynistic take. Today, I'd like to focus on my favorite princess in particular, Aurora, from Walt Disney's 1959 box office failure, Sleeping Beauty. Now, I absolutely loved Aurora as a kid. She has always been my favorite princess since day one. I had the movie on VHS and DVD, I put all my fake jewelry into a cardboard Sleeping Beauty jewelry box, I even saw Sleeping Beauty at the El Capitan Theater once. I will acknowledge that she is not the best princess, however, I want to counter the narrative that she's a bad princess, and to go even further, a bad role model for young girls. Part 1. The movie is old. The first thing I'd like to talk about is how Disney movies pre-Renaissance featured narratives that are fundamentally different from the kinds that feature in movies today. Modern movies, and stories in general, tend to have a more developed story overall. They feature more characters and flesh them out more, giving them flaws and personal arcs as well as more subplots or commentary that make the story more relevant at the time of its publication. All of these are things that older movies tend to lack as the focus then was more on telling a story in an artistic way, especially with Disney films that targeted a largely child audience. Because of this, I think people look back on older media and forget that it is very much a product of its time. They look for these details that feature heavily in stories from the last few decades, but not so much in older ones. The best way I can think to explain it is that the story was sort of placed on a back burner in older Disney media. Not because of laziness, but because the main focus was the artistry, especially with a movie like Sleeping Beauty, in which Walt had notoriously high standards for his animators. It's for this reason that Disney opted to adapt short stories like Grimm's Fairy Tales. It gives them a loose story that most people are generally familiar with, but not too emotionally invested in, where changes to the plot could be seen as controversial. This allowed them to focus on the aesthetic details that weren't as prevalent in the original, such as the setting, character design, and overall ambiance. This is one of the reasons I think people feel so nostalgic about the older Disney movies. They aren't deep, but they're nice to look at, which is something that's severely lacking in the entertainment industry nowadays, with the focus primarily being on creating and adapting stories with important themes. Part 2. Aurora is not the main character. She is a character. Now that we've discussed the fundamental difference between movies today and movies like Sleeping Beauty, it's time to delve deeper. Since the primary focus of the movie was not to be moving in terms of the plot and the characters, there is also a lack of individual character growth. You'll notice when watching the movie that every character seems to be utilitarian. They fulfill their purpose to move the story along and not much else, which makes it harder to identify a true protagonist. The movie is not the journey of any one character. Everyone gets their time in the sun. The first third is mainly about the fairies protecting Aurora, the second third about Aurora and her dream of falling in love being fulfilled, and the last of Philip saving Aurora. It's a mishmash of how the different characters contribute to the story, versus one character and their posse, which is what we see more of these nowadays. Take Rapunzel for example. In Tangled, the story revolves around specific choices she makes so she moves the story forward, versus Aurora in Sleeping Beauty, where the story revolves around her tragedy, which is not within her control. This brings me to the second critique I tend to notice online, which is that Aurora only has 18 lines of dialogue in the film, and that's bad for some reason. Firstly, this is untrue. Aurora actually has 32 lines, and the reason for this misconception is because some of her lines are sung and not spoken, or attributed to Briar Rose in the script. Secondly, the focus of the film was not on the dialogue. Upon rewatching, I noticed that most of the lines, aside from fairy banter, tend to be more whimsical, Old English-esque plot-moving lines and less actual conversation. This makes it difficult to attribute any of the dialogue of the film as a character-defining moment. As we've already discussed, the film was created to showcase the artistry of the animators, so the majority of the storytelling is visual. And if you really want to get into the numbers for comparison, Philip has 22 lines and Maleficent has 25. So while the number of Aurora's lines incorrectly tallied at 18 seems low, 
It was on par for this movie specifically. Thirdly, we need to talk about another inspiration for Walt Disney, which is the Tchaikovsky Ballet, Sleeping Beauty. If you've listened to the ballet and the Disney Sleeping Beauty soundtrack, you'll notice many similarities because the Tchaikovsky Ballet was a big influence on the orchestration of the score for the Disney movie. And if you watch the movie, you'll notice that the music is predominantly featured. This is another trait that is common of old Disney movies, but not so much with the newer ones. They have these incredibly intricate scores that read a lot of life into the films, and sometimes, like with Sleeping Beauty, take center stage over dialogue, which is why there is such minimal dialogue in the film. Part 3. Aurora is boring. People love to complain that Aurora is boring, that she's a non-character who's asleep for most of the movie. Firstly, she's not asleep for most of the movie. This is another blatant lie that gets circulated on the internet. In actuality, she falls asleep at the 51 minute mark in a 75 minute movie, which makes her asleep for roughly 26% of the movie, including after she wakes up, which is just over one fourth of the runtime. And now that we've decided she is actually conscious for the majority of the movie, we can dissect what kind of person she is. The main scene where we get to see Aurora shine is the woodland scene. I'll give you a quick summary. Aurora is rushed out of the cottage by the fairies because they're planning her birthday, so she runs off to frolic in the woods and chill with her critter friends. Once there, she regales them with a recurrent dream she has, in which she falls in love with the prince. They, feeling sorry that she isn't allowed to interact with other people, dress up as a prince so she can live her dream. She does, and Prince Philip stumbles in to dance with her, having heard of her dream. They dance and fall in love and make plans to meet again later that night. So, let's get into it. We initially see that Aurora is eavesdropping on the fairies as they plan her surprise, and when they realize she's there, they send her away, and she goes. From this, we can see that she's willing to humor the fairies and let them believe they're secretive. Basically, we learn she's kind, which is one of those characteristics that people like to equate to being boring, or a trait that's attributed to a character in a bout of laziness. I disagree for a few reasons. Kindness is not as common as people like to believe, especially not in the way that's presented in Sleeping Beauty, in which it's unnecessary and unbeneficial. And it's the kind of kindness that I think is most important to show kids, because it teaches them to simply be nice to people, to not ruin other people's fun when they don't need to. It makes Aurora a good role model for them. Next, we hear Aurora telling her woodland creatures about her dream. She keeps them on edge the entire time, almost like she's telling them a secret. She makes them believe it's real, until they reveal that it's a dream. From this, we see that Aurora is imaginative, not only in terms of her fantasies, but also in her storytelling. Then, the woodland creatures dress up as a prince to make her feel better, and I feel like if a real person were presented with this situation, their reaction would be to sulk. But Aurora doesn't. She isn't caught up in the sadness that her dream won't come true, but happy with the compromise that she's been afforded, and she's playful enough to appreciate it. This is also a good trait for kids to see. Overall, I would describe Aurora as a very light-hearted person. She has all the traits that one would want to see in a happy teenage girl. She's kind, and she's appreciative and imaginative, a person who sees the glass half full and works to make the best of every situation. She's the kind of person I like to be around, the kind of person it's fun to hang out with, it's the perfect kind of character for kids to look up to. Part 4. Love is good, actually. This is probably where I'm going to be the most passionate, because this is the argument that upsets me the most, due to it being blatantly misogynistic. It is a widely known fact that people like to hate on things that young girls like, simply because young girls like them. We saw this with the rampant Visco Girl hatred in 2018, and with the rise of anti-Britney queen Avril Lavigne in the early 2000s. There's a lot to say about how society views and treats young girls and related topics like pick-me girls and not like other girls girls. It's a phenomenon that, despite being pointed out in retrospect, repeats itself time and time again as a new thing for girls to fawn over pops up. It's blatant misogyny that demonizes aspects of femininity purely for being feminine or attributed to femininity. However, one that I haven't seen people rush to defend is the desire for love. Aurora is the epitome of the heteroromantic teenage girl in that she wants to experience a fairy tale romance. 
and people don't like that. They don't like that because they think it's a bad message for young girls to prioritize romantic love. It's not seen as a worthy aspiration. I don't like this take because it demonizes love and the girls who do want it. I don't think it's absurd to say that part of the typical teenage experience is the first crush or first love, the first time you're completely enamored with someone else. To be blunt, they're mad at Aurora, a teenage girl, for wanting to have a typical teenage girl experience. I think that's as close as you can get to saying you hate teenage girls without saying it outright. It's really just another way to hate on girls because of their interests. Love is not seen as a pursuit that should be prioritized. Despite being one of the most relatable stories, it's somehow not inspiring, and it should be discouraged in favor of other pursuits, which I think is misguided. Everyone has their own goals in life, and it's my opinion that building interpersonal relationships is one of the most important parts of life, including when it's romantic. I just think it's wrong to demonize Aurora as a character because she has an interest in love instead of archery or science. People think that hating characters who strive for a romantic relationship will encourage girls to pursue other things, but it only enforces that love is a bad thing, which is horrible to teach children. Part 5. Victim Blaming The problem that people like to present with older media is the lack of strong female characters, and I won't try to dispute that fact. Older media tended to focus on men in leading roles, but I also think it's wrong to diminish the female characters we had as demure and passive. Some people have already started to rectify this with a rise in Cinderella defenders. People point out that she was making the best of her situation in a silent soldier manner, while before she was scrutinized for her inability to leave her evil stepfamily. Her story has been rewritten as the tale of a woman who found a loophole and escaped her situation on her own while marrying a prince as a bonus, which is a great way to reframe Cinderella. But I want to acknowledge that not all stories are like that. Sometimes you can't save yourself, and it's okay to need help. We've already discussed that Aurora is not the titular character, but she is the character that the tragedy happens to. She is the one that's cursed the one who needs to be saved. And I want to emphasize that she did need to be saved in this situation. There was no way for her to save herself, which tends to bother people because it takes away her agency in the story, which is true, and also the reality sometimes. There's this push right now for female characters to have more agency, to be a strong role model for young girls, which is great, but that doesn't mean that Aurora is a bad role model. She's just a different type of role model which is for some reason difficult for people to grasp. And unfortunately, I think this view perpetuates a problem with society right now through victim blaming. It places the blame on the victim of a situation and makes them feel guilty for being unable to do more, for needing assistance. I see the same problem in people who hate Snow White. The narrative around Snow White is that she became a servant to seven gross men and was then whisked away by a prince. Rewatch the movie, and you'll realize she's a young girl who was threatened out of her home on pain of death and had to take refuge in the first place she could find, taking advantage of her skills, which were housework, because she was forced to be a scullery maid in her own home. I don't want to get too into it and say that people who hate Sleeping Beauty are necessarily victim blamers, but it's important to be mindful of the narratives you lean into. Part 6 but the prince is creepy. This is the shortest section because it's simple. The last thing I can think of that people get upset over is when Philip kisses Aurora to wake her up from the curse, often citing the issue as a lack of consent or claiming that he just kissed a random sleeping girl. I feel like this take completely ignores the context of the movie because Philip didn't just kiss a random sleeping girl. After he's captured by Maleficent, the fairies recall Aurora claiming to have met a boy in the forest that she was completely enamored with, and Philip's king father saying the same thing about his son. They connect the dots and realize the boy must be Philip, so they go to rescue him, knowing he can wake up Aurora. When they rescue him, they catch him up to speed. So Philip knows who Aurora is. She isn't just a random girl. And he doesn't just happen upon her. He takes on a fight with a dragon so he can break the curse knowing the strength of true love. 
And when he kisses her, it's because there's no other option. If he doesn't kiss her, Aurora will exist only in eternal slumber, essentially death. I think this context is important when people bring up the consent issue, because it refutes the allegations that Philip is just a creep. It has been explicitly stated to him what the consequences of the kiss would be, and the consequences for Aurora if he doesn't. It's not a kiss fueled by his own desire, but rather an act he was asked to perform to save Aurora, and I think that makes a big difference. Overall, I think Sleeping Beauty is a great movie, and that's partially due to my own bias and nostalgia. I like the songs, and I liked that as a little girl I looked like Aurora. It's not the greatest movie of all time, but the energy people put into perpetuating hate is so astounding, because it's not by any means a bad movie. And if this video has changed your mind in any way, or at least opened it, I highly recommend re-watching it. You may not have the same love for it as me, but you can at least appreciate the artistry and the music, and maybe even cut Aurora some slack.